automation in the federal end. So I think I turn on the microphone so you should be able to hear me loud and clear. No response from the audience. I'm not gonna load this, so I'm just gonna put it maybe higher, but does it work like this or yeah, no? Yeah, higher? Good. One, two, one, two. <laughs> uh, That's not gonna work. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the idea of the talk of today is presenting you a little bit the, the, the stage where we are at the moment in Fedora, everything you can do as a developer, what you can use to make your life simpler. And then I have a number of things which you probably know, I have some things which you might know, and I have a bunch of things which do not exist, so you probably just don't know about them. So I'm gonna first with a bit, little bit of background of like who I am. So I'm Pingu, well, Pierre is for the full first name. Uh, you might actually know the small penguin there because he's been there since about 2007. So that's his, like the avatar which I have everywhere. So if you look for my face, you normally find that avatar. Uh, I started so Fedora in 2007 uh, just by writing some documentation on the French uh, Fedora user website. I became an ambassador and then I started packaging and then I started packaging and then I started packaging and then I started infrastructure help. And that's all started with uh, me on a Saturday afternoon asking Toshio like, do you have a small thing to do for me? And it um, turns out that a couple of years later I'm actually employed by Red Hat to do what I was starting doing a couple of years ago on a Saturday afternoon where I didn't know what to do. So I'm actually now in the Federal Infrastructure team in Red Hat, so working with Ralph here. And I got, a, I got a big paid for what I was doing before, so that's really awesome. And the things which I'm working on are like, well, that's actually the, the rest of the talk yet, so I'm gonna do, leave that next one first. So the things which I'm working on are like a number of uh, web applications that we run, and then I also have interest on basically making your life easier. The, the, the way I vision my work is basically building the tools that make your life guys easier. So I have the time to implement things and what I like to do is basically looking around what are, is, what are the demands from the community, what are the ideas from the community. But then the community is community of contributors and then they only have their free time which is, as you know, limited. And I'm actually paid to do that. So if you have actually ideas, if you have demands, if you have things that is bugging you, just, just come, come to us, come to me and we'll see if the, we can make that happen or if it's ac actually already existing. Uh, so let's start with the beginning of a developer life. You have this, you have this cool idea, you have this very awesome project, so you actually want to set up something for your project. So you're gonna look for something like eventually Dev Assistant, which is presenting again this afternoon, uh, and which is Slavic, uh, Slavic, well, one of the core contributor, one of the main uh, developer. The idea is that it basically helps you to structure your project. It provides you a framework and an environment in which you can develop your cool ID. So you don't have to, but you don't have to care about the basic dependencies, the basic di directory structure. Everything is taken care of that. And you have even a nice GUI so that you can tweak it. And of course, since we are all developers, we, are, we all have our own way of making things. Well, Dev Assistant is nicely customizable. You can just write your own class, your own in plugin for Dev Assistant so that you can use it afterwards for set up every single project that you want to work on. So that's really nice. The, then once you actually have the, break, the basic directory structure, then you need to host it. And then you have a number of hosting platforms. I mean, you all know GitHub, I'm pretty sure. You're probably, you of course have heard about Git or you also Bitbucket. Uh, you probably have heard about Fedora Hosted, at least I hope. Uh, Fedora Hosted is, has a number of problems, but it has also a number of good things, which I'm going to come back on the next slide. But basically, why do you want a hosted platform? What are the advantage of this? Well, it's simple, you don't have to do maintenance. You don't have to look for a domain name. You don't have to look for a server. You don't have to look for hosting space on the web. This is all provided in one package by the different uh, hosting solution. And then what do they offer with that? Well, they offer you a bug tracker most of the time, a ticket system. They offer you wiki, oops, sorry. They offer you a wiki for most of them. They for you a place where to put your source that everybody can access to. Of course, that's interesting when you do programming. Uh, they offer you eventually a mailing list. Well, that's actually not true for four of the three hosting solutions which I pointed on the previous slide. GitHub doesn't provide uh, mailing list. Gitarius does not provide mailing list. Bitbucket does not provide mailing list. Fedora Hosted does. Hey, awesome. By the way, you don't have to have your project on Fedora Hosted to actually have the mailing list so that you can also just use the advantage of one and the advantage of the other. Uh, 
I'm gonna come back on the mini image talk right now. You also have hooks, like for example, git, git hooks, so that you can actually close tickets in the commits. You can actually refer specific tickets on a commit. So that's these, thang, these things which are nicely when you want to order, when you want to handle multiple tickets, bug reports, RFPs, and so on. Uh, but then there are two things which are on, f on uh, Fedora hosted and which you won't get anywhere else. Well, the first one is back on the mailing list, and the second one was just presented a few minutes ago by Ralph, the Fed message integration. So you, you basically, all the tickets which you get, all the activity on the track can actually go onto the bus, and then you can actually have a listener and consumer and play, live, with, live with that. So I'm back on the mailing list now again. Who be among you have heard about HyperKitty? Great, who has seen it? That's already much less people. Well, I have a couple of good ideas now. You can't say you have not seen it anymore. These are the screenshots. <laughs> so this is the landing page. This is the landing page for the, the Fedora mailing list. So we have about 200 something mailing list. I think there is a number somewhere here, but I don't see it right now. Uh, this is the landing page. So you know where the, the, the actual list of fedoraproject.org where you have this huge list of text files with description. Well, this already gives you some ideas. Well, you still have the you still have the the list names. You still you have already the the email address of the list, which you did not have before. You have again the description there, but the most interesting part is probably on the right here, where you have an overview of the activity of the list over the last few days. So, just by looking at that, you actually know how alive the list or the project is, and we are actually working in deploying HyperKitty in production for uh, some of our lists, and. Federal hosted will be coming to that well as soon as we have something which is stable enough. Just to get you a, a little bit more, you know the archive view from our, from mainline at the moment. Well, this is the archive view from mainline three. So you have again the activity on the list on the top. You have the latest post on the list. You can actually like or dislike them. You can see the number of people and the number of reply on each thread. You can see who has the who is the most active person on the list. No surprise for Adam. Uh, you can see the most active discussions. So like what, what's the trendy subject on the federal devil list? Uh, I have to say I do not know how, when the, this database was updated, but the screenshot is from yesterday. Uh, so these are the, all the cool things which you can do. On HyperKitty, the idea is to bridge the, the, the meaning list and form gap. So what you can do here as well is, I don't think I have it here, but you can actually post a new email, a new thread directly from the web interface. You can reply to a thread directly from, an, from a, the, fr the website. So that means that when you actually want to contribute to a project, when you actually want to contribute to a discussion, you don't have to subscribe to the list. You can just go on the web interface, answer the question, ask your question, answer, answer yeah, to the question, follow the discussion, and you don't actually have to get all the emails of all the threads. So you can go on the user list and say, well, I have a problem with Fedora 21 and it just doesn't boot and then you explain and you just, just like you would do on a forum. But you don't get every other single email which goes on the Fedora user list. And if you have a question about the kernel, well, you can just ask that question and don't follow everything else. And if you're still a mailing list person, then you can just register and get all the emails and everything and you, you won't see what's happening on the, on the web interface, so you won't have like the, the votes and everything but you just use the, the regular emailing system like you're doing now, so it won't change that experience. Uh, after that, there is one thing which we cannot automate, and I'm very sorry for you guys, it's we can't write the code for you. So once you set up your project, once you have your mailing list, once you have everything, well, well you still have to write the code, and that's something which, yeah. We're working on it, but apparently the NSA is not happy with it. <laughs> yeah, for writing the code. <laughs> And then once you have actually write the code, something which is quite nice is actually to test it. You know, like I test the code in production where you might actually want to do that beforehand. And then you have unit tests. And then there are a number of solutions to actually do continuous integration. So running it the unit tests every time you change something on the code. Fedora project is actually proposing a Jenkins instance, which is on the best effort basis. It's something which we host on, on our cloud. We have a Fedora 18, 19, 20 uh, builders. We have uh, EL6. And we should get an EL7 uh, bi bi uh, builders as well. Uh, so you can j basically test how is your project uh, performing on Fedora and as well as on the uh, real platform. So for example, the, the infrastructure, we are all running Fedora, but all the servers are running EL. So it's quite interesting to be able to run the test on EL when the deployment is on real, what we develop on Fedora. Um, 
I'm not going to go to the user ones. Previous year is mostly on uh, something which is hooked onto GitHub, uh, Buildbot, something which a number of projects are using. We look into, it, it's actually packet on Fedora, so it could be easily used. Uh, but yeah, well, I think Jenkin was doing the job, so we stick with that one. And then, who amongst you are using SQLite database for testing? And who amongst you have had problems when testing against SQLite and using PostgreSQL in production? <laughs> well, that's the idea that FETU is actually answering. The, so FETU is a very simple system. It's just one host that we have on, a, on our cloud again. It's a PostgreSQL server, and then you have one, uh, well, you have one interface, and then you just call basically FETU slash uh, new, slash FETU new, and you get a temporary, an half an hour valid PostgreSQL database. So when you test, you can actually just query that, query that URL, get the output, uh, get the output, so you can either get it as directly text and then you just copy paste that one in, the, in your code or you can get it as JSON if you want to process it differently. And that allows you basically to run your unit test against a PostgreSQL database. And when you use SQL lit for development, and uh, for uh, yeah, development and then PostgreSQL for production, you eventually end up with weird situation. And that allows you, well, basically, I still run my unit test locally on SQLite. But the Jenkins instance is running FETU on everything. And then FETU, it, runs, it works quickly, it crashed on FETU, and then I actually get to fix the bug before it hits production. Uh, then, well, <laughs> you have your unit test, you have your project, you have your mistakes, you make a release. You, you, you have a number of platforms where you can release your tools. Uh, for Python, you have PyPy. For Ruby, you have RubyGems. For Perl, you have Cpan. For R, you have Cran. There are a number of repositories, and if you're a developer in a certain language, you probably know which one is best for you. Uh, the idea is, of course, that the, the community around the language can find your project, and that it's documented somewhere. But you actually might want to be a bit more proactive on that. So that's the idea of Fnuknu. Fnuknu is, uh, so that stands for the Check New Update. And it's a wiki page that we have at the moment, which is the release monitoring page on the wiki, where you can just say, well, this is my Fedora package. This is the, the place where you can find the new releases. And this is the regex which you should use to actually find if there is a new release. And what it does at the moment is that it, there is a current job. It checks if there is a new release. And then if the, if the version in Fedora is older than the new release, you get a bugzilla ticket. Well, Fnuknu is working along the same line, but a little bit different. The idea is that. Um, you have a project, and this project have new releases, and when we have a new release, we publish a fed message message. And one of the cool thing about that is that, so this is the front page. At the moment, the, we have ported the, the projects which are on the, on the wiki page, so we have about uh, 4,000 projects. We can do much more. And, but one of the cool thing is that, so these are the basic information, but yeah, one of the cool thing is this part, basically. So this is the PLAS project, which is a fr uh, web framework in Python, and it's packaged in Fedora uh, in, Python f in Python PLAS. So when we get a message, we can say, well, this project has a new release, and that, and that project is packaged in Fedora under that name. And then we actually want to integrate that with the Debian bus, and then what you're gonna get here is that Debian name is, I actually don't know how they call it. So, and then you can get Ubuntu, you can get Arch, you can get Gentoo. So what we have here is a central place to map project to RPM package and a central place to actually announce to the different distribution that there is a new release. So we can have, this, con this is not production ready yet, we are still working on it. This is gonna be hosted on releasemonitoring.org for the simple reason that you basically don't see any relation with Fedora here and there shouldn't be any. This is a generic project. This is something which every distribution wants and every distribution is reinventing the wheel at its own special ways because yeah, we all need to know when there is a new version and we're all too lazy to go on each website every day to actually check if there is a new version. So this does it for us, this, which is kind of nice. And then, well, you actually, once there is a fed message message, but you actually want to know about it. So this is the, the, fed, the federated uh, notification system that Ralph uh, wrote. And basically there, it listens to the bus, to the fed message bus, and you can f enter filters. So you can say, I want to know everything about this user. I want to know everything about that package, or I only want to know, and you can actually set like where you want to know it. So you can have it by email, you can have it by IRC, you can have it on your phone. So it's actually quite nice because like if you have a Koji build, which works, which was successful, 
then you don't want to eventually to have that by email because it works. So you just create the body update and you're done. So you just say, well, just tell me on IRC when the build is finished and it works. But if it fails, you actually want to be able to go back to the logs and maybe you don't have the time to look at it right now. So you can say, well, let me know on IRC because if I have time, then I will look at it right now. But if I don't have time, send me an email as well. And then I have the link to the, to the log route, to the, yeah, to the, all the logs which I can go through and check why the build fails. So FML just basically allow you to do that. So the question was uh, how overlapping it is with the current notification system. Yes, you will get both emails. You will get the email from Koji and the email from FML. The ID, for example, PackageDB2 will not be sending emails anymore. PackageDB2 sends fed message message and you get the, f you get the notification by FML. And one of the things which you can do, like you know the current implementation of PackageDB, every time you click on a button, you get an email. Well, it's gonna be the same thing on PackageDB2, except that on FML you can say, well, for the PackageDB email, just wait five minutes before you send me the email. You know, just gather all the changes which happens on five minutes and then just send me everything at once. I don't want to know every single time that something is happening, but you know, five minutes is good enough for me. Yeah. You can say 10 minutes, you can say two minutes. And you can do that on the IRC or the email as well, again. But yeah, PackageDB2 is not gonna be sending emails anymore, which is pretty cool also. <laughs> uh, so this is how it looks basically, please. The bugs ticket for the system update, you mean the release monitoring update. Uh, well, there is still the idea that the, this will happen, that you can subscribe and get bugs ticket, but then it's not gonna be running the cron job anymore. It's just gonna listen to the fed message bus. And it's going to say, well, if you're registered to have a notification for a new release and that the fed message bus says there is a new release available, then you get the bugs ticket. Uh, one thing that we are working on also on the, the, the notification system is, for example, the Twitter backend. Like, you can actually directly tweet, I got a new badge. You can tweet, I built something. Well, this is depending how much your followers are up here, but you know this. But I got a new badge, I got number one on the leaderboard. I mean, this is pretty cool to tweet, right? <laughs> so that, that's one of the ideas that we have. And you can go, you can go further than that. You, can go, you could go Facebook, you can go Google Plus. I mean, there is, the sky is the limit and it was. But we have more work. No, we don't have more work, we have one, but <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> so th this is basically how it looks. Uh, so this is an RC notification. You can uh, set the, you can name your filters and then you have a number of, uh, so this basically says all the message that concern Pingu and then all the bits, all the build that completed. So all my, all my builds that completed on Koji, I'm gonna get an RC notification for them. And then you have a number of default filters that come by, uh, yeah, by default, uh, like you get uh, badges and so on, but you can turn them on and off. So if you go on holiday, for example, you can turn off the notification system. I don't want to know anything about this anymore. Uh, if you go on holiday and then you ask for Android notification, that might be handy. <laughs> that would be a good idea. <laughs> I'm on holiday, please see that guy. <laughs> I'm not sure that's gonna happen though. <laughs> It's actually a good idea, but I'm, I would be afraid of abuse of that system. Uh, so yeah, one other thing, the, the Twitter backend, we actually used to have fed message on Twitter and it got banned because it was a little bit too chatty. So the idea here is that if you reactivate the Twitter backend here, you have to be careful about your filter because we are not using the fed message Twitter account, we're using your account. So if you get banned, well, you have to get unbanned. <laughs> we are fine. <laughs> so yeah, just be careful about the filters on the, the Twitter backend. Uh, so in summary, where are we now? Uh, we have set up our project, we found the place to put it on the web, we wrote the code, we tested it, we released it, we announced the release via the, the Knu Knu, and our user can get their own notification uh, about the new release. So that's so far so good. Uh, what's left to do? Well, you can, you can still integrate your project. I mean, I know it's not trendy anymore, but you can still integrate your project into the distribution. And there are a number of tools that are there to help you. There is a number of two spec tools. I mean, that's a nice star here. Uh, you have like one for R, which I have disclaimer, I wrote it. 
Uh, it also does RPM, by the way. Uh, you have PyPy to spec and then PyPy to RPM, which does pretty much the same thing in a different way. Uh, so Python to spec, Python to RPM. You have VGEM, you have even uh, POM, uh, POM to spec. So these are tools which are just helping you to just, you know, generate the, ba the basic spec file, which you can then twist and submit for review and so on. Uh, so you don't, uh, yeah, most of the things you can, you know, you don't have to do it anymore yourself. Uh, then you also, you, you of course know that these tools, if you have been packager for a while, uh, on quality checking what is my package doing, is it correct, doing it correctly? So you have RPM lint, you have mock, which makes sure that you get the, the build requirements correct. And then you have Fedora Review. So Fedora Review is now run by Science Lab and Alex. And the idea is that we have a number of checks, I think uh, around, yeah, more than 150 yesterday we said, and which just check, you know, is this, is, is this a Java package? Yes, if it's a Java package, then does it follow the Java guidelines? Is it an R package? Does it follow the R guidelines? Is it a Python package? Does it apply the, the Python guidelines? And it does a number of automated checks, like did you actually use the upstream source or did you viciously tamper with them afterwards? Uh, and then you, you bah, you should not do that. Uh, but Fedora Review will just say so, so good thing for the reviewer, but also good thing for you if you're starting packaging. Uh, yeah, well, it's it also actually integrates the, the first few tools, so, and it, most of you have probably used it if you've been a little bit into packaging, so I'm just going to go quickly on that one. Uh, then you can, once you have actually you make the spec file, the RPM, you actually want to distribute it. Well, you can build it locally and, s and tell your user, trust me, I built it and I did not tamper with it. You can also use one of the, the official build systems. So you have Koji, you can do scratch build, but scratch build have a limited time life. And there is the new copper, cool other package repositories, which you can use. And then this is actually pretty cool because it also gives you a YUM repo. So you can just tell your user, well, this is the YUM repo, just install that file, enable it and just you install my, my package. This is also pretty cool. It's all, it offers an API and with an API token, which is actually one of the, I actually think it's the first tool that we have in the infrastructure, which you use API token for authentication. So what that means that the, the token is uh, valid for one month or six months, I'm not sure exactly. But for that time of, for that time, you can actually use the command line interface and you don't have to log in. So you can actually script and do something like daily update, daily package. You can get, uh, so you, the DNF people are actually using Jenkins to generate the, the RPM, but you could use your package and then have a small script which update the spec, build it on copper, and there is a daily update. Uh, the only problem is that, uh, well, the advantage is that it provides you a reliable and reproducible builds. Uh, your user can trust you a little bit more. Uh, copper provides you the package repository. The only problem is that Copper does not sign packages yet. So that's, that's something which is work in progress, I believe, but it's just not there yet. And then uh, you actually want to integrate into the Vistros themselves. So, you know, the, the usual, uh, the usual dev or RPM uh, st story. If you want to, in to go on Fedora, then there is an extensive documentation on how to do that. There are a number of advantages, like you actually integrated into the system, the dependency management is taken care of by the packages, by the, yeah, you are more uh, happy to get or uh, the, the package manager. Uh, it's, you get a very interesting collaboration with the packager. I'm sure there are packager in the room here and they, they all collaborate nicely with upstream. And then, well, so this is a pretty much the state where it is now. I already gave you a couple of ideas of what's coming, but we are going into the world now. This is like stuff which are surreal. They're just basically ideas on paper and nothing in the code yet. So buckle your uh, seatbelt and let's dive in. We actually want to help new contributors. We actually want to have new contributors coming into your project and you know, just starting to dive in the code and help you. And for that, there is often in several projects problems of you have to actually set up the build environment. So for example, we have the, the Fedora account system FAS, which was written, I don't know, years ago. <laughs> and it's using a framework which basically is not going to run by itself on Fedora 20. The, the packages are still there, but by itself, it's not gonna make it. And what you could consider is Ansible recipes. And I'm gonna use a very trendy word here, Docker. You could actually provide container of your application to your new, to your user. They just download. The, they just download. They run the Docker file. 
and period, they are they just log in onto the, the container and they can start hacking. Okay, you have to figure out these things about uh, Git integration, how they are go getting the, the patch from the container into the UML box, but these are things which can help you as upstream, as developer, to actually get new people set up quickly and start working directly. And so they don't have to you know, spend a day or two just setting up the system to actually start implementing the feature that they want to have. This just does it for you. Well, for them, yeah, at least. Uh, then we have the ideas of auto rebuilds. We have packaging on Fedora which are rebuilt in every mass rebuild and they are not rebuilt in between. And then the question becomes, what should we do about package which have not rebuilt for like more than six months? They were there in Fedora 18, they are still there in Fedora 20 and nobody touched them in between because there was, for example, no mass rebuild in Fedora 19. Okay, that's not the case here, but that's the idea. So what we could do, and we have that now thanks to FedMessage and DataGripper, is that we can actually tell for every single package in Fedora when was the last time it was rebuilt successfully. And what we can do is that for every single package that was not rebuilt successfully for more than, say, six months, we can just target, uh, make a run scratch build. And w does it work, does it not work? Well, that's if it doesn't work, you get the nice uh, fed to be from source uh, bug. But basically what this gives us is a um, kind of continuous mass uh, fed to be from source mass rebuild check. And every six months, you know that your package is gonna be rebuilt if, you're not, if you don't update it in, the, in between. Then there is the question of, you know, the broken dependencies report, the ROID report that we get every day. The, when we branch, then we actually get two reports a day. And that's quite often the problem of sun and bump, which are not uh, announced or that, you know, there are, there are so many dependencies to treat that they build the first one and then they started the dependencies and they didn't arrive at the end of the list by the end of the day. What we could do is we actually know when there is a sun and bump, we actually know when there is a dependency breaking. So we could just know like there is a dependency breaking, so just get all the dependencies and then just make a scratch build. Just rebuild it against the new sun and see whether it builds or not. And if it builds, well, just submit a patch to the, to the, uh, to the packager, to the maintainers. And if it doesn't rebuild, well, then they will have to look into it. But at least everything which is, you know, simple rebuilds. There is some bump, we just bump the release and we rebuild. Does it build? Yes, no. That's something we can do. And that's actually something which I think we should do. That would just make our life so much easier. Uh, then we have the idea of who amongst you have been using Bugzilla for package review? Who amongst you liked it? <laughs> Bugzilla is a fine tool. Bugzilla is it, do, it does the job. The problem is it did the job when it was chosen as the tool to do package review because there was no other tool. Who amongst you would prefer to actually do spec review on a GitHub-like interface? You know, just you have the spec in front of you, you actually can comment on the spec saying like this line is wrong, you should actually not do that here. And then underneath that you have a command section. By the way, the license of the, the license of your source are wrong. But you can directly comment on the spec line, on the spec in front. You have a Git, a Git integration. We are already keeping all the spec file in Git. So we could do the review in Git itself. And then just the history of the package doesn't start when it's integrated into Fedora, but it starts when it's integrated on review. And then you get the whole history of the spec file, including the review in there. And what you could do as well, so that's the idea here. We get off Bugzilla, we integrate with the, the Git, which gonna be which gonna become the canonical place for the package in Fedora. Uh, you can actually comment directly on the spec. And since we have that, we have a dedicated tool, we can actually do scratch builds. We can directly call, well, you submit a package for review, does it build on Koji? The number of packages which comes from newcomers that didn't necessarily pay attention, or even old, uh, old packagers which just you know, do that automatically and they run RPM build on the system and they forgot to run mock on the one. And it's, op it's open there for on the Bugzilla and it stays there for three months because people are busy and nobody's reviewing it. And then someone arrives and builds it and it just doesn't build. And then the reviewer says, well, sorry, it doesn't build. And then the, the, the one that the submitter takes another two months to reply because he was busy with life. And then you have uh, something which is open on Bugzilla for five months and which still doesn't build at the end. So what we could do is directly, uh, you submit a, re a request, we just build it. 
And that's something which we could do very quickly also when we have the friend message on Bugzilla. Is the, as the, is the category a package review? Is it new? Is it open? Yes, trigger a scratch build, comment on the Bugzilla ticket. Then we have the integration about Fedora review. We have, you have already presented it. It does a number of checks against the packaging guideline, against uh, the, the quality of the package. You open a Bugzilla ticket, we do a scratch build, we run Fedora review. What we put on the ticket, everything that that's fine, and then everything is asked to check. And then when the reviewer arrives, it doesn't, it doesn't have to do to redo that part. All he has to do is to, to do the, the left checks. Licensing will still and remain and will always be there. We need, a, we need a human, there are tools to help us there, but we need a human to go and dive in there. And there are a number of things which could be more checked, and there are, Fedora Review can be expanded to wherever we want. Fedora Review provides the framework, and we, we just have to write the test that we can. And then one of the ideas, of the crazy ideas that I'm actually having with that project is that we have newcomers, and when newcomers want to actually update something on package, they open a Bugzilla ticket, and then they have to wait for the maintainer to react, and that can take a while. So what about having you know, the pull request from GitHub? The, the, so instead of just opening a, a ticket, like I would like you to update that package, I can directly provide you the, the pull request of the change to update the package. And all, the maintainer, all what the maintainer has to do is merge, rebuild. Easy. So make it a bit easier for newcomers to actually not become packager, but help the packager by you know updating the spec file, proposing new version, proposing the system D integration. We have the guidelines are changing every so often, but our our process and that makes sense is that you don't rebuild your package for new guidelines, so you do that only at the next update, and then you're supposed to uh, when you remember it, that at the next update you actually clean the spec file to follow the new guidelines. What we could do with that is some sort of mass pull request system where when there is a new guideline, people, people who like that can just take your spec file, update it, submit you the new, the new request, and all you have to do is, is merge. In that case, you, w you don't even have to rebuild, just merge a pull request, at the next update your spec file is ready. Uh, then we have the automatic packaging system. We have a number of two specs tools, and they just provide you the spec files, and some of them provide you the RPMs. We have uh, the knu knu that gives you when there is a new version, and then you add a little bit of precaution because you know dependencies and stuff, and you have copper, and ta-da, you have an automatic system. So you could, uh, you could take the PyPy package, you get the older Python package, you get PyPy, there is a new version, I bump, I build on copper, and you have always the, the new version on Copper, and you can propose the package maintainer. Do you like that or not? Do you want to do, do you want it in your package? Yes or no? Does it require more work? Does it require? Is it? You know, there, there are things like package update which we can automate. We can make things easier on us. So that's a bit the idea. Then, uh, yeah, that's okay. That's overlapping basically. The, so we are monitoring new new web. We get uh, we bump the version. We do a scratch build, and we propose you the change. If the scratch build succeed, of course. Uh, so there are things which this is also something which, as soon as Knu uh, is live, this is something which is easy to automate. Get a new release, get a new, uh, get the, listen to the bus, listen to the new release, get the Fedora package, clone, bump the release, and we already have the bump script that's used for the mass uh, rebuild, and then just do a scratch build on Koji. And if it works, tell the maintainer. If it doesn't work, well, tell him too. Uh, then we have Summersham. Summer, so the Summersham is the brand new ID. This is, this is we're speaking about a three days old ID. Even my manager hasn't heard about it yet. <laughs> uh, so who amongst you have done package review? Who has read the GPL? Who has reviewed package which are GPL licensed? And who has read the GPL of this package? All of them? So are you actually sure that the GPL file that's included in the package you're reviewing is the canonical GPL? Are you sure that the last line of the code does not include, if you package that on Fedora, get me two beers, or I'll create a beer for that matter? Well, you don't pretty, pretty much, because you open the GPL file the first time, and then you, re you read the header, and then that's correct, that's, comp that's included, that's consistent with the headers on the source code, and that's consistent with what's on the spec file. Well. I'm sorry, but 
you actually didn't read the GPL. You, uh, you actually don't know which, uh, which is the license which apply there. So the sum sum ID is that, the sum sum ID is that basically we're storing every single SHA-1 of every single file on every single package in Fedora. And this is something which we have, uh, we have basically the, the, the idea running at the moment is that we are listening to the bus and every time someone uploads a new package on the Lucaside cache, we don't know the package, extract, get all the source in there and get the sum, the sum, the SHA-1 sum of the file. And we store that in a database. So we're able to tell you how many copies of the, li of the GPL license we have, how many different copies of the GPL license we have, how many copies of the li GPL license with the old Free Software Foundation address we have. And then we also, more interestingly, how many bundling of jQuery we have, how many bundles of the md5.c file, I don't know how the name of the C file, but how many, p how many projects you know, are bundling small files like this and it's not detected upon review? And then also something which is can, be, can be quite nice is how many files change between two versions? Because we have all the files of every version, so you can actually know, well, I want the SHA-1 of uh, that version, the SHA-1 of that version, and then which, which file did change? So uh, I'm actually thinking about the Reddit people here. I've heard that you actually have to review between version updates. Well, with that system, you would only have to review some of the files, or according to the project, all the files, but then, uh, sorry guys. <laughs> Well, th there are limits. I mean, if you just updated the copyright here, you get a new SHA-1 sum, so you still have to review it. But, you know, there are cases where during the same year, that's, that's, not, that's not done, so you, have, you can be lucky. So, so the, 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 the question is that there are some tools which are used internally for reviewing packages. And I'm going to answer you, we have been talking with the people that are working on the next version. <laughs> and they, well, that's a, three, that's a three days old idea, so they, we've been mentioning it, uh, they haven't seen it yet, but like, I've been pushing for the review to them. Yes? That's actually a good idea. Uh, the problem I would have with that is how do you actually check I have the SHA-1 sum of the GPL file, give me all the package that ship it. How would you check that? So, the, so I'm just repeating for the microphone again. The, the question was what about instead of keeping a database, what about putting them on the Git and then we can actually do Git diff and, benef and take advantage of the, the, sh the the SHA algorithm which is used in Git itself to, to get the, the, the unique identifier of a file. Uh, but yeah, my question is. So one of the comments from Sunnyslav is that basically Git and large project, and here we're speaking about a very large project eventually, is not gonna end, is not gonna co collaborate very well. Uh, but it's an interesting idea, definitely. Uh, so in conclusions, we have already a number of tools which can make our life easier. We have a number of crazy ideas which can make our life even more easier, and the future is bright. And with that, I'm of course welcome any questions you have still remaining. So the question is, uh, did we consider the, the review server to include the, the complete spec file, the, the life of the complete package, the spec file for the life of the complete package? That's actually something w that's actually a little bit what I have in mind when I'm saying the, the newcomers should be able to have pull request. So basically the, the, the front end of our spec file would not be package.fedoraproject.org anymore, but whatever URL we use. So it's not a CGIT interface where you directly have access to the Git, but we could have I'm actually thinking, you know, a GitLab interface, kind of, although it's Ruby, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, but 
Yeah, something like a GitLab where you could actually see, browse the, the Git history, see the, the changes, and be able to clone and do a pull request there. So we could do we could even do fork and copper rebuild. That that would actually what probably what would happen if we get the like the auto update system or the auto rebuild system in place, then we, you would need get we we clone we bump the release we t we do the build if it works we create the pull request if it doesn't work we s we send a FMA notification or something like that. So, so the question is on Fedora hosted projects. We have the, the Jenkins instance, but then the, the hooks might be missing for triggering the, the build on Jenkins. Uh, I'm gonna have a few part response on that. The original idea that the, the project on Jenkins have an auto check, so every 15 to 20 minutes, they check if was there a change on the project, and if there is, they start the build. Or you can have your own uh, Git hook installed that at every push, you actually trigger the, the rebuild on Jenkins. Uh, I know a project that does it on the client side, and there should be no problem to install the hook on Fedora Seed. That's just a matter of as as actually asking the infrastructure to do it, to deploy the hook. Test it and bring it. I'm sorry if that was the kind of uh, reply you have, but I will invite you to submit a ticket on the, on the track because that's uh, that's a canonical place to ask this kind of th these questions but So, uh, no, Jenkins are configured to work with the, the upstream repos. They are, con they are, they are working on with only one repo. So you would have to run the unit test yourself. So the, the, the upstream repos have like a 20, a 15, 20 minutes turnover to check if there are chains and rebuild. Some of them have the, the on push rebuild. Uh, but if you have a fork of the upstream repo and you're pushing to your fork, the, well, you could ask the infrastructure to set up a project on Jenkins for your fork, but that might be declined actually because the, the, the yeah upstream is there. So if we start to have a specific a specific Jenkins project for every fork or for every one for the same project, it's you know a bit overlapping. <laughs> so in that case, yeah, I, I'm gonna say you go, you would have to run the test yourself. Include, sorry? Uh, so, I don't say your question again. <laughs> Uh, the quick answer is that there, there. I know, like the the Python project has a coverage plugin, so you can get code coverage. You can get uh, code style uh, checks as well, and these are installed on Jenkins. But I don't. The specific tool you're referring to, I actually don't know. And I think that's. Uh, I'm out of time. So thank you guys for coming.